Hey everybody, I'm Chris Guthridge, podcaster slash broadcaster over at 4 Player Network, and this is my top 10 games of 2015. has been a great year for indie game development. And one of the more interesting, kind of offbeat games I played this year was Her Story. Now a lot of you are probably thinking Her Story isn't really a game. And you wouldn't really be wrong. Even more so than games like Everyone's Gone to the Rapture or Gone Home, Her Story exists more as a interactive experience than it does an actual game. Say what you will, but I don't have any inherent problem with those sorts of games. If it's done well and the story is interesting, I'm in. The basic conceit of her story is that the game is a simulator of a police database filled with a bunch of interview videos of a suspect played by actress Viva Seifert in a crime that was committed in 1994. That's all you know going into it. You have no details of the story, of the suspect, of what happened, Anything. You go in completely blind, and it's up to you to try to sift through this database like a bunch of puzzle pieces in a box and and put together the picture. You do this completely at your own pace and in whatever order you choose. Now, it's kind of hard to really say more about the game without getting into super spoily territory, so I'm going to keep this brief. So I'll just say that while her story isn't necessarily gamey in any sort of traditional sense... It is still a really, really interesting piece of interactive storytelling, and if you've got a few hours, I highly, highly, highly recommend you check it out. So, this one comes as a real surprise to me, but my number 9 game of 2015 is Undertale. I gotta be honest, I was completely unsure if I even like this game until about the last two hours. But now that I've gone back through and played it twice, I can see that I initially misjudged it. Um, Undertale is a really... (laughs) Undertale's a really... Undertale, like her story, is really kind of difficult to talk about in any great detail without kind of ruining what's so great about it. Or without really spoiling anything. The best I can say is that Undertale is a very interesting look at the old school turn based RPG genre. It explores a lot of tropes very common to the genre that we kind of just take for granted. For instance, like the idea of combat and fighting everything that we encounter in a in most video games, especially RPGs. Undertale looks at that and questions why, why most games are set up that way, and in turn offers its own alternative to that formula, which is unique, to say the least. Now, I'm admittedly sort of an impatient gamer. If a game doesn't get its hooks in me in the first couple hours, I pretty quickly lose interest in it, and Undertale really is kind of a slow burn. You can get through your first playthrough in about anywhere between like 6 and 10 hours. I think it took me about 9 hours to do my first playthrough. And like I said, I wasn't really sold on the game until about hour (laughs) 8. That is to say, the game has a hell of an ending. Really takes everything that you've gotten comfortable with in Undertale and turns it on its head. I hate to overuse words like meta, but Undertale really is... (laughs) Kind of a meta experience. And that's kind of what really sold me on the concept. The game does a really good job of existing beyond its boundaries, if that's cryptic enough for you. Again, without getting into too much detail, the game is extremely self-aware. And even when you've forgotten how self-aware it can be, it kind of comes back and reminds you. And that's what made it kind of a special experience for me. 
Now, I'm not necessarily on the same level as Undertale's rapidly growing fan base as far as my love for the game, which is why I've only got it at number 9, but I do think this was a really interesting game and it was at least the ninth best game that came out this year. Again, not a very long game, but if you've got the time, I think you will find it rewarding. And prepare to maybe play through a second time. Yeah, it's one of those kind of games. My number 8 game for 2015 is another very bizarre sort of non-traditional gaming experience. It's called Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes. This game was originally introduced as a title for VR and is shown at shows using Oculus Rift headsets, but it works just as well on a monitor as it does a VR headset, which is nice. The basic setup is that one player controlling the game is in a virtual room with a bomb that they need to defuse. Only problem is, these bombs are randomly generated and the player doesn't really know what they have to do to defuse the bomb. The bomb is broken into a varying number of different modules and each one of these modules are an increasingly complex series of puzzles that the player has to complete before the timer runs out and the bomb explodes. This game is designed to be a multiplayer experience because while the main player defusing the bomb is actually at the computer playing the game, the other players are off to the side with an actual paper manual describing the different components of the bomb and how the player is supposed to defuse them. The whole point is that the player can't see the instructions for how to defuse the bomb and the people talking the player through defusing the bomb can't see the actual bomb itself. So this game ends up being a hectic exercise in communication between the two groups. Now the nice thing about it is there's no practical limit to how many people can be playing the game at one time. There's one person defusing the bomb, but there can be as many people as you want talking the player through how to defuse the bomb. Earlier levels of the game featuring simple bombs might not require that many people to help talk you through it, but bombs featured in later stages in the game become much, much more complex and complicated and require many more steps to actually defuse, so having more people to sift through all the information of the bomb manuals might actually be helpful. Again, I say that this game is a non-traditional experience because it really feels like most of the gameplay is happening outside of the confines of the actual game's program. Most of the game is in communicating between people, flipping back and forth between the manual pages, trying to give clear and concise instructions in a timely manner so that the player defusing the bomb can understand what's going on and accomplish his tasks within the allotted time. I have to say, of all the games I've played this year, this one is probably the best in terms of a large group party game experience. If you've got friends or roommates, this is a fantastic game to break out for everyone to gather around and try their hand at defusing bombs. Like many of these high-stress co-op games that seem to be becoming more and more popular nowadays, Lovers in a Dangerous Space Time jumps to mind, this is a game that will test your friendships. But I have to give this one my number 8 award because it's just such a unique, interesting idea. There's really not that many games out there like this. And the elements of gameplay that take place outside of the game itself are just really, really, really interesting to me. If you're looking for something to play with a large group of people, I highly recommend Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes. Now, I will admit, this next one struck a particular chord with me. My number seven game of 2015 is Chroma Squad. Chroma Squad is a turn-based tactical RPG revolving around a set of five stunt actors who decide that they're going to open their own television studio and produce their own Sentai-style superhero television show in the vein of Power Rangers. Now right there, I'm already on board. I love superhero fiction, I used to be a tremendous fan of Power Rangers when I was younger, and I'm also really interested in strategy RPGs. But beyond the innate reasons of why I should like a game like this, Chroma Squad does bring a lot to the table on its own in the way of personality and really interesting ideas. Missions play out pretty much how you would expect they would. They are combat encounters between you and random mob enemies and the occasional boss character. 
But it's what's happening between those missions that I find particularly interesting in that you have to actually manage your TV studio. You have to hire and pay your actors. You have to get health insurance for your crew. You have to manage the studio equipment, buy new cameras, new lights, new green screens. You have to make costumes and weapons for the characters. You have to market the show to get more fans that will allow you to unlock more benefits and power-ups for your team. And all of this plays directly back into the combat in the show as well. So, for instance, if your actors have really good health insurance, then in battle, they have higher HP. If you're... If your studio is equipped with state-of-the-art high-tech lighting equipment, then there's less chance for enemies to dodge your attacks. All of these concepts play into each other in really clever ways that I, I just immensely enjoyed. I had a big stupid grin on my face the entire time I was playing this game. If you like strategy RPGs, if you're a fan of the quirkier, more humorous side of indie games, I think Chroma Squad is well worth the $15 price of admission. Honestly, I'm kind of surprised this next game fell outside of my top 5, but my number 6 game of 2015 is Fallout 4. Now that may sound a little negative, and a lot of that just comes from the fact that this game by and large feels like an incremental update of the past two Fallout games, Fallout New Vegas and Fallout 3. Now, much of the same mechanics and systems operating under the hood in those previous games are still present here. Updated a little bit, kind of spit-shined for next-gen, but not necessarily all that different. I was expecting to be taken by surprise by a new numbered Fallout game, and I ended up getting kind of more of the same. But, all of that said, that formula is still one that I really, really like, and it's in good form here in Fallout 4. If nothing else, this game looks much more vibrant than the last two. And some of the new mechanics such as the crafting system and the base building system are actually really fun and engaging. I didn't think I'd enjoy building my own settlement as much as I actually did. And the weapons crafting system for me helps alleviate a classic problem that everyone always has playing these games, and that's weight management. Since I was able to modify my weapons, I didn't feel a need to bring that many different varieties of different weapons with me. For instance, I didn't need to carry a laser pistol and a laser rifle at the same time, I could just have my one laser weapon and modify it for whichever situation I was about to encounter. Now, it didn't completely negate the issue of the weight management system, but it helped. I also personally like the voiced player character. I know it's not everyone's cup of tea, and I can see where that would kind of ruin the immersion of people more into the role-playing aspect of this RPG. But for my money, it made dialogue seems much more... Uh, bearable. I also really like the Bioware-style tonal choices in dialogue options. As I mentioned before, settlement management, which is probably the biggest of the new systems present in Fallout 4, was a surprisingly fun aspect of gameplay. I ended up spending hours and hours just working on Sanctuary and the Red Rocket gas station and all these different settlements. A lot of times it feels like a bit of a distraction, but sometimes in a Fallout game, maybe distraction is what you need. Otherwise, you're just diving through old runes and cramped interior dungeon spaces over and over again. And honestly, that does tend to get old after 60-70 hours. If you played the last several Fallout games, you really already know what you're getting into with Fallout 4. But if, like me, you enjoyed those games, then I would recommend giving this one a shot. That's why I'm giving Fallout 4 my number 6. Alright, now to the really good stuff. The top five. At number five is Batman Arkham Knight. By now, it should be no surprise that any halfway decent Batman game will be held in high regards in my eyes. I am a tremendous Batman fan after all, unrequited. But luckily, I think beyond its appeals to Batman diehards, Batman Arkham Knight is on its own a great game. Being the fourth and final Arkham game, Rocksteady really went the distance for this one. The new open world map of Gotham City is the best in the series, leaps and bounds above Arkham City and the reused Arkham City map from Arkham Origins. The map in Arkham Knight is a joy to explore. 
one of my favorite particular additions in the new open world map were these really smartly designed indoor to outdoor predator areas all over the city. A lot of the a lot of the open world rooftop predator areas now incorporated into the buildings themselves so you could move among floors of the building, find new hiding spots, go from inside to outside. It was just really cool. Arkham Knight, even for a Batman game, also had a pretty dense collection of gadgetry at your disposal by the end of the game. So much so that I kind of got to the point where I was forgetting different gadgets that I had on me. But as has been the case in the past, I think these gadgets were all really smart and inventive and there was a great interplay between using them for puzzle solving and combat. And it's always a joy to see what new ideas Rocksteady has come up with over the course of this series. Along with that came the introduction of the widely discussed Batmobile. Now, I know a lot of people got really burned out on the Batmobile by the end of the game, and I agree that this game does tend towards an over-reliance on the Batmobile for puzzle solving, for combat, for everything, really. But all of that aside, the actual Batmobile itself, as it functions in the game, is amazing. It is a joy to drive. The tank controls are very crisp and responsive, even if you do have to rely on them way too much. For me, there was no greater joy than gliding around the skies of Gotham and then dive bombing towards the street below, only to have the Batmobile round a corner and catch me just in time, and I drive off down the road. Oh, that, oh, I just love that stuff. It was so good. It was classic Batman, and oh, it was, loved it. Sorry. <laughs> Now, I think the story uh, was really well done, at least in the first half of Arkham Knight. Uh, they got off to a really good start. A lot of the new cast members, like John Noble as the Scarecrow, were fantastic. Um, I do think that by the end of the game, the story kind of fizzles, especially as far as the identity of Arkham Knight is concerned. Um, that's something that really should have been a huge moment in this game, and it really kind of just fizzled. But there are plenty of other story elements going on here that I think outshine the failings of the Arkham Knight plot. I don't want to get into too many details because this is a pretty spoilery story, but if you have any interest in Batman, you, you should have played this by now, assuming you had one of the necessary next-gen consoles. Now, any other year, I think Arkham Knight would have been a top one, top two game for me. Um, but this was a pretty dense year, and there were some really great games uh, that we will discuss coming up that came out this year. And as such, it's kind of hard to give Arkham Knight a higher grade. But I, I do still think, for me, it was one of the best five games to come out this year, and that's why I've got it at number five. Scarecrow's men are already there. They're trying to take out the server room. My number four game of 2015 has been causing quite a stir for even longer than it's been out, and that's Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain. Now I'm sure by now we're all at least somewhat familiar with all the crazy antics surrounding Konami and Kojima's departure earlier this year and the release of Metal Gear Solid V, so I won't really get into it here. This game to me represents at once a great victory and also a great failure. A victory in the gameplay mechanical department of the game, and a failure in the storytelling and characterization of the game. Now the story content of this game is really bizarre and lacking and kind of just all around disappointing by the end of it. And series icon Big Boss aka Snake really kind of feels like more of a stranger than he should in his own game. And like most people, I found these elements of the game to be underwhelming at best. So they're not why this game made my top 10. The reason why this game is at number 4 on my list is because of the mechanics and the gameplay involved. I think speaking from a gameplay perspective, this has to be my favorite Metal Gear Solid game I've ever played. I particularly love the new open world structure of the game. I think it's a lot of fun moving around between different bases and outposts, and I think it also solves a major problem I've always had with Metal Gear Solid, in that I always felt compelled if I was discovered while sneaking to either reload a previous save or restart the current mission. I always felt like there was a very wrong way and a very right way to play these games, and if I wasn't playing correctly, I had to completely restart the whole experience. The open world facilitates a gameplay cycle that allows you to recover from being discovered while stealthing, 
and carry on with the game without feeling the need to restart or reload or anything. I also really enjoy the addition of the buddy system. Characters like Quiet and D-Dog offer widely different skill sets and abilities that make playing with them feel very different, yet still very useful no matter what. Quiet, in particular, once you've maximized her potential, really kind of just almost breaks the game. And I mean, come on, how can you not love that adorable D-Dog? Come on. I also love the addition of vehicles to this game. Tanks and trucks are great, but in particular, I love the walker gears, particularly D-Walker, which you can customize with all sorts of different weapons and add-ons and robot arms and stuff. It it's so much fun to run around on this thing and switch over to its, to its drive mode and drive across the hills really fast. It's just a blast. The chopper support is also a really interesting component to the open world aspect of this game, where you can get picked up and moved around to different mission sites. And I love the supply drop system as well. It's really interesting that not only can you use this system to resupply and change out your equipment in the middle of the mission, but you can actually kind of use it offensively too by dropping it on enemies to knock them out. This game also has a bevy of new gadgets, all of them are just really quirky and interesting. Uh, the cardboard box in particular this time around has so many different just bizarre functions like flipping it up to form a decoy or sliding down hills on it. It's just it's so much fun. And the new inflatable decoys are a blast to just throw out to tr attract a guard's attention and then deploy them to knock them out or upgrade them later to become more sophisticated distractions to use on sneaking missions. Uh, they're great. I also really enjoyed the soldier recruitment system where you could actually like kidnap enemy soldiers and uh, turn them to your side and then even play as them if you wanted to or send them out on missions to uh, gather resources for your base or even better than that, use them on sabotage missions against the enemy. So if you send like a team of soldiers out to hijack a shipment of flashlights and then you start taking night missions, the enemy soldiers won't have flashlights and they won't be able to find you as easily. That, that kind of stuff is just great. I, I love that interplay there. And of course, no discussion of Metal Gear Solid 5 would be complete without mentioning the Fulton recovery system. This thing is just on its own level. It's, it's, its breadth of utility and entertainment are astounding. It's really cool to be able to steal enemy equipment like gun emplacements and trucks and cargo containers and all that stuff, and strapping them onto soldiers, for me, just never, ever, ever gets old. I particularly love some of the upgrades of this concept in other parts of the game, where you can get, like, Fulton turrets that will track people and automatically shoot a Fulton on them and shoot them into the sky. It's, it is just incredible. I love it. So like I said, while the story narrative aspect of Metal Gear Solid 5 is really kind of just not very good, the gameplay and the mechanics of this game are incredible. So much so that on that alone, I can still give it my number four. And then there were three. My number three game of 2015 is Tales from the Borderlands. I don't know what surprises me more. That a Telltale game is in my top three, or that a Telltale game about Borderlands is in my top three. Now, I am not by any stretch of the imaginations a fan of the Borderlands franchise. I was pretty positive about 2 when it came out, but I wasn't a fan of 1, and I definitely didn't care for the pre-sequel, and overall, I've just never really had that much love for the franchise. But Tales from the Borderlands is a completely different story for me. This game completely charmed me in Episode 1, and and never stopped charming me all the way to the end credits of episode 5. The writing, the characters, the humor is very much on point. Now, as you know, it's a telltale game, which means there isn't really much gameplay to speak of, so it's kind of weird that I would hold it in such high regard for being a video game, I admit. But the storytelling really is just that good. I found myself hotly anticipating each new episode as it came out over the course of the year, and it never once disappointed me. Reese and Fiona and Vaughn and Sasha and Loderbot and Gordas, they're all amazing characters. They are incredible. And I want more of them. I hope that they show up. I hope that Telltale does another season of this series. I hope maybe even Gearbox will do something interesting with them within reason. I mean, really, there's just 
not much else to say about this game. Fan or no, if you like a good comedy action adventure, check out Tales from the Borderland. I'm serious. You'll thank me later. Come on. The sooner we can upgrade Gordis, the sooner. This one's a little weird for me because I don't really care about cars and I especially don't care about soccer or football or well, really any sports. So I find it odd that my second favorite game of the year is Rocket League, which is a game about cars and sports. Now, I know this game is technically a sequel to supersonic acrobatic rocket powered battle cars, but I never played that game and statistically speaking, neither did you. So to me, Rocket League was a completely new, innovative experience. Rocket League is one of those ideas that only comes along once in a great while that just seems so brilliant and yet so stupidly simple that it's amazing nobody else ever thought of it before. Rocket League is just RC cars playing soccer, and that's it. That's it. Nothing else to it. The physics-based action of the game are just so satisfying, so much fun facilitates so many amazing moments that this game is infinitely replayable in my opinion. This is the kind of game that I will always go back to for years to come. Just a quick little palate cleanser between titles, maybe just got home from work and only have about 30 minutes to play something, I'm gonna pop on Rocket League. Of course I am, because why wouldn't I? This game is incredible! As someone who's always been something of a fan of competitive multiplayers, yet never actually terribly good at them, Rocket League is perfect. Easy to pick up, easy to enjoy, easy to have fun, and you can feel yourself getting better every successive match. And the player base for this game is ginormous. There will always be someone on the servers whenever you want to pop on and play. It's just, it's the perfect pick up and play game. And that's why I'm giving Rocket League my number two game of 2015. And so it's come to this. My number one game of 2015 is Bloodborne. Because of course it is. The Soul series have been among some of my favorite games since I started playing them, so it's no surprise that Bloodborne would find its way into my top 10 list. Now admittedly, this one feels pretty different compared to the other Souls games. And while I did miss some of the more RPG aspects of Dark Souls and Dark Souls 2 that were missing from this game, I still think it was a really interesting experiment that largely succeeded. I really liked the faster retool of the Soul style combat, replacing shields with guns and creating a higher emphasis on dodging and dashing. I was also really taken with the world and mythology of this game. This is something of a weird issue for non-Souls fans, but these games have always nurtured a rich mythology that isn't necessarily very apparent while you're playing the game, especially the first time around, but is always just kind of seeping through the edges of your experience. This doesn't mean that the lore of the game is any less actualized than any other game that features that up front and center, it just takes a little extra work to get to it. But I found the world of Yharnam to be incredibly fascinating. The intertwining mythology of the ancient Thumerians and the cosmic old ones, the healing church, the school of Mensis, it was all very fascinating. And personally, I kind of like the cosmic horror element over the traditional dark fantasy we've been getting from the last several games. I think the world design and the aesthetics of Bloodborne are incredible as well. The high-flying buttressed cathedrals, very reminiscent of An Orlando from Dark Souls, or Hades Tower of Flame from Dark Souls 2. And I think this world maybe has become my favorite amongst the series. I also really enjoyed the new trick weapons introduced in this game. Unlike traditional swords, or maces, or bows, or any sort of fantasy fair you would see in the Dark Souls series, Bloodborne revolves around these really unique and sometimes grotesque, complicated contraptions. These were really, really cool, and the way that their use in gameplay changed by switching their modes was really, really interesting to me as well. Now, I know one of the main criticisms of Bloodborne is that it seems a little shallow compared to previous Souls game, and in a way that's not incorrect. But personally, I really enjoyed the heavier action focuses in this game. Not that I don't love Dark Souls' emphasis on RPG in action RPG, but I do think Bloodborne proved to be a nice change of pace. Honestly, after all the amazing games I played in 2015, Bloodborne is still the one that I find myself going back to. It's the one I find the hardest to get out of my head. It just represents so many things that I look for in a game. And because of that, I have to give Bloodborne my number one game of 2015.
Well, kids, that's another one in the bag. 2015 has been a crazy year. I can't believe how many monumental games came out this year. Honestly, I think this is probably the most difficult list I've had to compile yet. Can't wait to see what 2016 is going to be like. Already looking like it's going to be another crazy year. Top 10 2016 is probably going to be another doozy. But I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for another great year at 4-Player Network, and here is to many more.